you a sort of a stream of consciousness lecture, and I, I may get distracted. So if I do, you've got to get me back on track with it. I'll be slightly rambling. I've put a few slides together today. And really, one message, um, and one message only, science is great. I would say that, wouldn't I? Um, but it's especially great if you do my job, because I'm an immunologist. So I work on the immune system. And the immune system, as you probably all know, hopefully defends us against nasty germs. But it also protects us from cancer. For example, the immune system keeps tumors at bay the whole time. It helps our digestion. It helps our brains. The immune system is central to much of our body's functioning, I guess. And we know that from maybe 100 years of research. But I guess also important is when it goes wrong, you get diseases. And we can talk about like malaria, if you like. That's your immune system failing to fight the malaria germ. But equally, if you don't know, rheumatoid arthritis, MS, Crohn's disease, diabetes, they're all dysfunctional immune system diseases. So if you work in the immune system, you're very much part and parcel of trying to find out what's going wrong in the body in these diseases. And of course, if you suffer from these diseases, it's especially relevant because this research will hopefully give rise to new treatments. Because many of these diseases, we've no cure. We've no cure for arthritis. We've no cure for lupus. And all this research is aiming towards finding a cure for these diseases. And the really good news is the past 10 or 15 years of all the branches of science. Now, again, I would say this, wouldn't I, as an immunologist, We've had a massive advance in immunology, and if you single out the immune system in terms of level of understanding, it's beating the brain, it's beating all types of other systems in the body. Our, our, our level of understanding has grown in the past 10 years really exponentially, and that's the story I'm going to tell you tonight, uh, how those discoveries have happened. And this year's Nobel Prize for medicine was in my area, and two other buggers won it. <laughs> 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 um, although they made some money, I'm going to give that story as well, they work in the immune system. This year's Nobel Prize for Medicine is for the immune system. I'm going to give you that story as well. And it is all about chemistry, of course. Um, the drugs are based on chemicals. Uh, they might be biological chemicals, or they might be small molecules like aspirin. These are the treatments that we're using to, to handle these different diseases, and hopefully cure them. I mean, that's the long-term goal. And next year, as you may know, uh, Dublin is European City of Science. Are you all aware of that? I hope you are. And I'm, on, I'm chairing the program. Peter's heavily involved as well. I'm chairing the program committee. And one of the themes is aging. And with aging, you get these diseases. So if Europe gets old, we'll be riddled with Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, arthritis, cancer. And of course, the hope is this research will allow us to live to be old without the burden of these diseases. So again, that's, that's the promise of all this research, I guess. But let me start off with something completely different. Right? Now, this is not to do with the immune system. So I'm going to sidetrack you slightly, right? But I'll come back to it eventually. It's great being a scientist. Why do I say that? Lots of reasons. It's a great job. You're, you're, you're discovering things. You're in a Star Trek. You're boldly going one moment before you're seeing things for the first time. My lab, luckily enough, over the, over the course of 15 years, we discovered something brand new, just like half a mile away. We saw stuff in my lab nobody else had ever seen in the world. And what a great thrill that is. So it's a great thrill to begin in the discovery business. A second reason is you meet very interesting people, right? Now, two little stories here. And this first story begins with this book. Now, this is a very important a book in the history of biology. It's called What is Life? It was written in 1943 by a Nobel Prize winning physicist called Erwin Schrödinger. Ever heard of Schrödinger? He discovered the wave equation. Strangely, he was in Dublin. Eamon de Valera had recruited him to the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies, DIS, in 1941. And his only obligation was one lecture a year. Wouldn't that be great? These academics are overpaid anyway. But one lecture a year. And in 1943, as a physicist, which is strange, he asked the question, what is life? Can we understand the basis for life? And he gave these lectures in Trinity College, Dublin. This is a copy of the book that was published based on those lectures. And De Valera had, had recruited him. This is a conference. There's Schrodinger there. This is in 1942. He held a conference at the Royal Irish Academy. There's De Valera. He invited Paul Dirac. These two won the Nobel Prize together for the wave equation. And this is De Valera. There's a worrying number of priests here, I know. See? <laughs> well, I don't know why there's a... But anyway, he, he, was, he was living in Dublin, and he gave the, why did he give this lecture? Well, in 1938, this paper came out. Now, if you're a biologist like me, this is like one of the key papers in the history of biology. It's called the Green Paper, Green Cover, by a guy called Max Delbruck. These guys were shooting radiation at fruit flies, strangely, right? And this radiation causes mutations. Like, you know, after a nuclear disaster, there's a high rate of mutation. So radioactivity causes mutation. <coughs> and they were trying to get the smallest amount of radiation to cause a change in the fruit fly development, a gene change. Now, the gene wasn't known at this time. Nobody knew what the gene was. DNA hadn't been discovered. And they, were, they, they realized that the gene must be physical, it must have information, and can we find out what a gene is? And from this experiment, they calculated that a gene was a 1,000 atoms big. Okay, so the minimum amount of radiation to cause a tiny change in the developing fruit fly, 
From that, you can see the gene that has that information is a thousand atoms big. Schrodinger said, this is wild. I'm a, I'm a physicist. A gene is physical. It's got a size. A thousand. And he began thinking, what would this gene be? And he said, well, first of all, it's probably an aperiodic crystal. Isn't that a horrific term? Now, what he meant by that was it had to be stable. Now, of course, as you know, what are genes? We inherit them from our parents, like blue eye color. That's based on a gene from your parents. It's got information, but it's got to be stable because you can inherit it. So it's a crystal. The information has to be there. So aperiodic is a word for information, really. And then he says they're in chromosomes. There must be some kind of code. And that was the first time ever, and it was written on the blackboard in Trinity, genetic code was used as a term for the first time. This book and those lectures inspired a whole generation of physicists and chemists to go into biology. And the most famous example is this. This is the structure of DNA. It's an X-ray crystal image. Watson and Crick saw this structure. You know the story how Rosalind Franklin got the structure? And, uh, and um, Watson said it was like seeing the most beautiful girl in the world when he saw that picture. And they wrote this paper, this famous paper, in Nature 1953, the structure of DNA. Now, why was that paper so important? It revealed that DNA was a double helix, two strands, and then when a cell divides, you get two daughter cells, the strands separate, and then you get a copy of each strand, and now we have two strands again. The basis for life was discovered by that structure, that the double helix explains genetics and the basic, the copying mechanism of the strands separating and then copying them. And, and this paper cannot be overemphasized, and very nicely, Francis Crick writes a letter to Schrodinger in Dublin in Kinkora Road. See the address here? That's where Schrodinger was living. And he says here, Watson and I were once discussing how we came to enter the field of molecular biology, and we discovered that we had both been influenced by your little book, What is Life? Isn't that nice? <laughs> and he says, we thought you might be interested in the enclosed reprint. You'll see that it looks as though your term aperiodic crystal is going to be very apt, because that describes DNA perfectly. It's an aperiodic crystal. And that, that's a great example, really, of... Uh, now, why am I telling you this? Well, last week, I found myself in Cambridge, in the UK. Now, who is that? You see? Shocking. That's James Watson, the man who was on the paper. And I met him at the conference, and said, James, you're a hero. He's like Elvis Presley. You know, you're a hero of mine. And he said to me, yeah, let's go for a pint. I'm not joking. Let's go for a drink. And when they got that structure of DNA, they went, it was lunchtime. And lunchtime came along, and they went into this pub called The Eagle. And they announced to the pub, we've discovered the secret of life. And that, we went to that pub, me and Jim, this is last Friday, and there's a plaque on the wall saying, this is where the structure of DNA was discovered. We go into the pub, and he says to me, I'll bring you to the very table we made the announcement at. <laughs> and there's the table, just there, there's me and Jim, having that pint. The beer in there is called DNA. You go to the bar, you're on a, honest to God, you're on a two pints of DNA. And I go up to the bar, and I said to the barman, he was a 20-year-old guy, I said, Who, who's that guy in the corner? Pointing to Watson, never saw him before in my life. <laughs> and I said, He's James Watson. Who he says? <laughs> I said, oh, this is just disgrace. So there's an example. This is the thrill of my life almost. Meeting Jim. My, my, I got it. At the age of 15, it's in the biology leading cert, Watson and Crick. To meet Watson was such a thrill. I spent an afternoon with him. He says, man, as a hatter, of course. <laughs> so you meet, you meet very interesting people. More importantly, though, I also met the Queen. <laughs> and there she is, you know, and that was in Trinity. Remember that when she visited? And I, I, I was tasked oh, yeah. with looking after her. That's one of my PhD students, Mustafa Alam. He came from Pakistan. He was in the lab a week, and next thing he's meeting the Queen. He thought this is the best thing ever, you know. So you meet interesting people. Let's get back on track here, for God's sake. <laughs> now then, uh, although yeah, I suppose Watson is relevant, because all our work, that the real triumph of biology came about because of molecular biology, because of the discovery of DNA, genes, inheritance, all of that is relevant to everything that we do. So it's worth, it's worth starting with that. Now, what I'm going to tell you about, though, is, is my own research, and um, specifically the area of immunology, and especially inflammation. I'll explain why in a minute. And you may know we have a new building in Trinity. This is the Trinity Biomedical Sciences Institute. It's on Pierce Street. We've put together five schools have come together to work in one facility, all on medical research. We've got chemistry here. We've got bioengineering, pharmacy, immunology, biochemistry, medicine, all in one building. We're just moving in now. My lab moved in two weeks ago. We're going to have 800 researchers in that building doing medical research. Hopefully, we'll all be in there by December. And, and when the building was launched, uh, the tea shop came along a couple of months ago. It was in the sun the next day. Super lab for buttons. It's like, so, I always like being called a button. Um, so, so all this research is going to go on there. It's fantastic. And the story I want to tell you, though, is a specific, specific area of biomedical research, immunology, inflammation. Now, as I said, this year's Nobel Prize has gone for this area. And here are the winners. Bruce Beutler, <coughs> Jules Hoffman, Ralph Steinman. You may have heard he died on the Friday, sadly, you know. Um, but these are my mates, Jules and Bruce. I've known those guys for 20 years. Uh, they made a key discovery in the mid-90s, which all my work is based on. And if they hadn't made that discovery, now I came along next. I'm sort of in the second 
the second line here. Uh, and really, it's all about immunology. They made a really important discovery in immunology, which I'll be telling you about tonight, of course, in great detail. And what I've worked on for 25 years is this process of inflammation. Uh, you're all familiar with this. This is chillblains. You know, inflammation, very important process in the body. It's, it, it happens when your tissues are injured, when you sprain your ankle. It happens when you have infections. It happens all the time. And inflammation really gets the immune system going. All this redness you see is blood vessels opening up to bring the immune system into the affected area, for example. That's why you go red. Uh, you get the swelling happens because the blood vessels get leaky because the white blood cells, which are the key immune cells, they leave the blood vessels to go into the tissue to attack the bacteria or whatever. So all the symptoms of inflammation are very important for driving the immune response. And really, it's become really clear that many diseases have a dysfunctional inflammatory process at their very heart. And a conference I was at earlier this year in Cincinnati of all places, David Baltimore is another famous scientist. He said this, and I made a note of it. He said, cancer, atherosclerosis, that's heart disease, metabolic disease, that's diabetes, autoimmunity, and things like arthritis, are all secondary to chronic inflammation. This places inflammation at the heart of modern medicine. So it seems as if this inflammatory process is key to many diseases. Why would that be? Why would inflammation cause all these diseases? Well, a very good way to look at it is this. Why would it be at the heart? Disease, how do we define disease? We can define disease as a displacement from homeostasis, is the technical term. So as you sit there, your, your, your heart's working normally, your liver, your, your, your lungs, you're in a homeostatic, means balanced state. If that gets displaced, that's disease. Things stop working properly. And this imbalance that happens, this homeostatic imbalance, can happen because of, a, of an infection, that'll imbalance things. It can happen because of a bad diet, that will imbalance your body in some way. It can happen because you get injured, you know, if you, if you, if you have a traffic accident, the trauma of that imbalances the body and that's what's causing disease and the job of inflammation very importantly is to sense that displacement so that's what it does and then restores things back to normal inflammation is good for you so if you cut yourself you get an inflamed uh, event that's there to repair that wound so it's a good event it, it, when it happens normally of course when it, when it goes wrong then you get disease and you get mischief is the word that's often used for this and to give you a definition of homeostasis because it's a bit of a technical term uh, every christmas my lab Give me a gift. Isn't that nice? Because I pay their wages. Last Christmas, they gave me this book called Effing Exams. And if you teach, like I do as well, students, these poor undergrads, you know when you're in an exam and you're desperate to find, write anything, you know, to get a, a one mark out of ten will do you kind of thing. And this is the collection of the worst exam questions, uh, answers ever to questions. And there was a, I opened up and there was a question, explain the concept of homeostasis. And somebody wrote down, it was when you stay at home all day and don't go out. Oh, no. <laughs> That's as good as any. Another one I found that I'm going to tell you because the fruit fly is going to become very relevant. This little fly has been used. I'm going to tell you about the research in a minute. Look at this. In the Hawaiian Islands, there are around 500 different species of fruit fly. Give a reason for this. There are approximately 500 varieties of fruit. Now note the word approximately there. So, so homeostasis is a very important process. Now, how do we get insight into this complex process of, of, of inflammation? How do we get a handle on it? Very complex. The tissues are red. They're swollen. They're painful. In, in arthritis, it destroys your joint. In Alzheimer's, it destroys the neurons in your brain. How are we going to understand that in more detail? Let's go back to 1914. Let's go places there. Now, I'll show you this because a maiden aunt of mine at the age of 92 died about a year ago. And in her book collection, I found this book. And it's The Modern Family Doctor. You know these books you can buy now? I mean, the BMJ, whatever. Um, 1914. If you had rheumatoid arthritis in 1914, what did your doctor do to you? This is what he did, right? This is rheumatoid arthritis. The diet ought to be as rich as can be digested, considerable amounts of meat, good sound wine or stout, and extracts of malt. The best drug is syrup of iodide of iron, whatever the hell that is. Sea sand. Now, it does say not regular sand. Honestly, sea sand should be heated in its tin, and poured over the affected joint as hot as can be bought. And then the best of all is this. Another method which frequently does wonders consists in the application of large blisters over the spine. These blisters being kept open for a week or ten days. This is rheumatoid arthritis in 1940. It is usual to give some opiate, I'll bet it is, <laughs> during the cure. But the results are so gratifying in many cases that they weren't deprived, even in hope of sick. I mean, this is nonsense. Yeah. Over the 1922, doctors did more harm than good. Physicians. Now, surgeons were good, they cut things out, that was useful. Physicians mainly poisoned people, injured them. They reckon 1922 is a key turning point. Antibiotics started coming. Diagnosis gets better, right? Before that day, you were, you were likely to be harmed instead of benefited by going to a physician. Now, you know on Kildare Street, there's the Royal College of Physicians, built in 1820. They were all quacks, you know, and yet they could build that wonderful marble building. 
Now, thankfully, medicine's got better since then, right? But really, it's terrifying to think how they were treating people in 1914, you know. And in many cases today, MS is a terrible disease. They can do very little for MS. They can do very little for motor neuron disease, almost nothing. And they're still poisoning people. They're doing the best they can. But we look back, I we look back in 50 years and think, you were giving someone high dose steroids. That's like a hammer on top of your head now. So, you know, medicine, the challenge is to get it better. And of course, the reason why things get better and the reason why there's advances is because of research. There's no two ways about it.